So we'll get started on the third lecture of this week. Uh, and uh, I want to continue our discussion of the random matrix model that we began uh, uh, last time, and then go on to more interesting models, uh, in particularly the SYK model. Uh, I trust you can all hear me okay. And uh, the, yeah, so the main point in discussing a few aspects of this model uh, is so just so that you have a simpler setting in which you can then see all the uh, different things that happen in the SYK model. So as I discussed, you have some uh, random matrix elements Tij, uh, which have uh, zero mean uh, and uh, mean square value uh, is T squared. Um, and they're all independent of each other. That's really the most important property. Okay. Um, so, you know, we take any given set of Tij, if you compute the eigenvalues, we get a whole bunch of eigenvalues, uh, which are spaced by one over n, uh, and go from uh, minus 2t minus mu to 2t minus mu. Uh, and uh, just in a few minutes, I'll show you how to get this density of states. This is the famous semicircular uh, density of states. So that's the average over these delta functions that you will get uh, spacing one over n. Uh, the position of those delta function will of course depend on what the Tij are. So any every given sample will give you a different set of Tij. Uh, but if you look at the density of states, that's an example of a quantity which is self-averaging. Uh, you just have to put some window function which is uh, larger than the energy level spacing then uh, as n goes to infinity, you'll always get, even for a single sample, uh, this, this particular density of states. So I just want to show you how you get that. And then we'll go on for the, uh, to talk about the, uh, the SYK model. Okay. Um, all right, so let's just go ahead and do it. Uh, since you're only interested in the density of states. Uh, and in fact, the simplest way to do this is to think of this as a many body problem uh, and just compute the Green's functions in perturbation theory in Tij. So uh, you have the Green's function, which you'll define as uh, Gij uh, of tau minus the time order product of Ci of tau, C dagger J of zero. Um, and uh, the zero to order term will be just the chemical potential. So G zero uh, in Matsubara frequency, I omega will be I omega uh, plus mu, because that's uh, it's negative energy, so it comes with the plus sign. Okay, so now you put in the Tij, this is, you know, the entire graph is very simple. So if I compute G, uh, then uh, I, it's just a single line, and then each interaction uh, is a Tij. So this is a Tij over here, uh, and, and oh, I'm sorry. So this also has a G0, let's put a site label, G0 i comma j uh, is delta ij. It's completely local in space or in position. Um, so, so this side is I outside, uh, this will become J uh, and this will be TJK uh, and so on. TKL, this will become K um, and L and so on. So you just have to sum these graphs and that will give you the exact Green's function. equal to this plus dot, dot, dot. Okay, that's of course a very complicated mess. Uh, that's just another way of uh, finding the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix. Uh, it'll take, you know, so you could do that uh, numerically, but we want to do something analytically. So what we're going to compute is we're going to take this quantity and just average it over all possible realization of Tij. So the line over line is, is the average 
over different configuration of the hopping matrix elements. Um, so what happens? Well, at first order, uh, you know, the, because this is zero, um, you know, the simplest term, of course, I should have written a few more terms. This is the third order term. Uh, the zeroth order term is this. Uh, and then there's this term here. Uh, and then there's two of them. Okay, so when you do this average, uh, this term just gives you zero. So this is just zero because of Tij being zero. Um, and this is going to give you something non-zero, uh, but it's also got a good product. The other thing I haven't put up here uh, is if you have different matrix element, Tij, uh, Tkl, star uh, average, uh, that's, that's basically zero uh, for ij not equal to kl, okay. Um, so therefore, what happens here to get a non, this, this is a consequence of these being independent variables. So that's very important that these are independent variables. Uh, so this is i, this is j. Well, this, if this is ij, that better be ji. Uh, and so this I again, um, and we represent this by uh, bringing these together, uh, something like this. So basically you repair them and you get a factor of T squared with this. Okay, and there's a sum over J uh, it, it, over there. And you also have to remember the, the N. So it comes in twice, and so there's a factor of one over n. Okay, so up to second order, uh, what do we get? So now I need to move this up. Um, so we've gotten G is equal to G zero plus this term. And this term is basically, uh, there's a G zero here, there's a G zero here and a G zero here, and there's a sum over J. So it's uh, G zero uh, times sum over J of another G zero, then the factor of P squared over N, and a G zero. Okay, we'll try to add. So that's what we get at this order. Um, so now one nice thing you notice is of course this thing has no dependence on J and the sum on J just gives you a factor of N. So, and that factor of N will cancel this factor of N which is precisely why I put that one over square root of N out front. Um, and so now you can uh, just get rid of this. Uh, and get rid of that. Okay, so it's, it's of order one as n goes to infinity. All right, now at third order, I've given you the graph there, but it's easy to see that's just zero because you have three of them and there's no way they can pair up to give a non-zero average. Um, and so the next term you have to look at uh, is at fourth order. So if you go to fourth order, what do you get? Um, all right, you're gonna have four, four terms like this. And now there's different ways of pairing them up. It's sort of like Wick's theorem, but you're just averaging over this Gaussian random number. Uh, it's not, doesn't even have to be Gaussian, but anyway. Um, so one, one particular pairing you can get uh, is something like this. This one and this one. Okay, now let's put in some site labels. So this is I, this is J. And this has to be I again, and this will be some K and that will be I. Uh, you get T squared over N, T squared over N. You get some on J, some on K. So this thing you can already see is G zero to the power five uh, times T squared over N uh, whole squared. And then factor of N from here and factor of N from there, which is N squared. 
Okay, so that's well behaved. Uh, and so it's finite and then goes to infinity. Uh, what else do you have? Well, then you also have this, this kind of thing. Okay, so now if this is I uh, and this is J, then this has to be again J and that has to be I um, because they're meeting at that point and this has to be K. Okay, uh, and now that you can see again, there's two variables to sum over J and K. There's two factors of T squared. Each of it gives you a one over N. So it's exactly the same type of contribution, uh, Z naught to the five, T squared over N whole squared, N squared. So there's one more left over. Uh, and uh, that's the slightly more tricky one. So this is, these averages cross. Okay, and now you'll see that, okay, uh, now life is a bit more complicated. Uh, if this is I and that's J, uh, then for this to work out, this better be I, J and I. Uh, and that could be K in principle. No, but this is J and that's J. Well, that's also, I guess that has to be, well, uh, TJJ, that's a real number. Okay, so in fact, even I must equal J. So the whole thing just doesn't work. In any case, so this, if I just try to estimate this is G zero to the power five, uh, and then you have T squared over N squared. And you certainly don't have a factor of n squared. Uh, maybe, well, I think it's n to the zero. Basically, j must equal i, otherwise the whole thing doesn't work. Um, so this particular graph, we can forget about um, uh, as n goes to infinity. So that's the essential simplification. Uh, now you can go to sixth order and you'll see the same thing happen. Uh, you'll get lots of plus contributions, but you, anything that has lines crossing each other will be down as n goes to infinity. So you can put this all together into a very simple equation. All the graphs that contribute are very simply written down. Um, so if I take the full Green's function and I call it G is the full line, uh, then you can see that all of these graphs that are non-zero are contained in the following equation. So G is equal to the bare graph uh, plus, uh, let's see. Uh, how does it go? Okay, sorry, I should have gotten this right. Uh, and then there's a full line here. Uh, and then another bare graph. Yeah, that's right. So this equation graphically is the equation G of I omega is equal to G zero. Uh, no, that's not quite right. I think that's, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a full line there. G zero plus G zero. Um, so we're going to write call this sigma times G zero times G and sigma is this graph. And in this case, just equal to T squared G. Okay. So this is the usual Dyson's equation for this very simple problem. Uh, and this tells you the self energy is just one graph, T squared times G is equal to G itself. Uh, and that will sum all of the graphs that I've shown on the board. And it'll include this one, it'll include this one, this one, this one. Basically what this graph tells you that the intermediate line should be a full Green's function. And this tells you, you can repeat the, anything many times. Uh, and that's why you have a full G on the other side. Okay, so these are the uh, very simple equations that you have to solve. Uh, let me write, write the equations again. 
because this is what uh, these are the same equations we're going to be looking at for quite a while with some variations. Um, so you have the following equation, G of I omega is equal to one over, you put in the values of G zero and simplify the first equation. So I omega plus mu uh, minus sigma of I omega. And the second equation I can write down either in time or in frequency, I'm gonna write it in time. Sigma of tau is T squared and G of tau. Of course, you can write it in frequency if you want it also, it's the same thing. Okay, so now these are very simple equations to solve because for each frequency omega, uh, there are two variables, G and sigma, and there's two equations, so it's just a quadratic equation. All right, so you go ahead and solve the quadratic equation, and uh, this is what you get. Uh, so the solution is um, so the solution is G of in the complex frequency plane uh, is equal to one over two T squared over Z plus mu plus or minus square root of z plus mu squared minus 4t squared. Okay. Um, and how do you choose the sign? Well, it depends on you know, which half of the complex plane you are. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, requirements you have to satisfy so that the Green's function makes sense. So it's, I won't go into that detail, it's relatively simple. And from this, you can compute the density of states, rho of omega, which is minus one over pi, uh, the imaginary part of the Green's function. And from this, and you get a very simple answer, which is, uh, uh, okay. Well, all right. Uh, yeah, uh, one over two pi t squared uh, times square root of, uh, yeah, okay. Four t squared minus omega plus mu whole square. Okay, and that's the exact equation for this semicircle over here. And you also get the bounds two t minus mu and minus two t minus mu from looking at the points where the square root goes to zero. Okay. All right, any questions? <laughs> okay, so now, you know, we can go ahead. So this is really a very simple Green's function. Um, just some finite density of states, no matter where the Fermi level is. Um, and we can go ahead and compute from this Green's function and from the density of states, um, anything you want to compute. So for example, you learn in undergraduate solid state physics, uh, you have the Sommerfeld law for the specific heat or the entropy. So the entropy um, S of this system, this many body system will be the number of uh, N times gamma times T uh, and gamma is pi squared over three times rho of uh, zero, where zero is the Fermi energy. So this is the Sommerfeld result, which I presume you have seen in your uh, solid state physics course. There's the, the, of any Fermi liquid or free Fermi gas has a, a density of state. So the density of states here is the value of rho of E at that yellow line. Uh, and you take that value and plug it in here and you get an entropy that's uh, linear in temperature. Okay. Um, all right, so now I also want to compute a few things in the canonical and the micro canonical ensemble. 
uh, not just the uh, the uh, 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 canonical ensemble here. In particular, we want the energy, uh, the entropy here is a function of the temperature. Uh, and what I want to compute is the entropy as a function of the total energy. Okay. Um, all right. So first I want to get the, the free energy. Uh, so the free energy F is E minus T S. Um, and so therefore one second, <laughs> now I'm going to forget this on the board, excuse me. Okay. Sabir, is the N in your formula for S because the density of states was actually N times rho of zero? Uh, so this is the single particle density of state is just a finite number that comes from this expression right here. And this is the total entropy of the many, many particle system. Okay. You're talking about this uh, N here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So now you can also use the usual thermodynamics uh, to compute uh, the free energy. And there's probably an easier way to see this. Uh, it'll be the ground state energy uh, minus uh, minus gamma uh, t squared over two. Okay, yeah, I think that's correct. So, so from this, yeah, so that it has to work out that way because you also have the relation uh, that Um, okay, so we know that S is minus df dt, and from this you can see that this is equal to, and there's an n here, excuse me, uh, that's equal to n gamma t, and E naught is the ground state energy, some zero of energy we're going to measure everything from. So for now you can, now you can use this expression here, you know S, uh, you know E, uh, sorry, you know S and you know E naught, so you can equate this to this and you can get what's E. So the energy as a function of temperature, uh, E of T will be E naught minus N gamma T squared over two. Uh, and then you'll get plus TS, uh, which is plus n gamma t squared. Um, so in the end, this is equal to E naught uh, plus, uh, minus, no, plus, sorry, n gamma t squared over two. All right, so what I want to do is now take these expressions and write down the entropy as a function of energy. Okay, so the entropy is then n gamma t, but I want to get rid of t and I can get rid of t from this equation. Um, and so therefore I will now see that this is equal to square root of two n gamma times e minus e naught. Okay, so that's the expression I want uh, for reasons that will become clear in a minute. So this is just a slightly unfamiliar way of writing down the entropy of a free Fermi gas uh, in the microcanonical ensemble. Uh, so in the microcanonical ensemble, you specify the number of particles and the energy, not the temperature. And so the entropy as a function of energy is this expression right here. The energy here is extensive. When the energy is extensive, you get a factor of N from here, you get another factor of N here. And so the whole thing is also extensive and the entropy is extensive. Okay. In fact, there's many different ways of getting this, this answer. Uh, you can also think of the, and uh, you know, if you have a sum total energy E, uh, you remember it's made up of the sum of all the occupied states. If you assume that these states are equally spaced, 
uh, this quantity here, uh, if the energy is also an integer, imagine they're all equally spaced, and you're trying to find the energy of the peak level. Uh, so you just you're, the way you can get the many body state with energy P is by occupying uh, some, some subset of these states so that they add up to P. So you can see that this entropy is simply a count of the number of partitions of the integer P. Uh, and if you look up the Ramanujan formula for the number of partitions of the integer P, uh, the leading term in it will give you exactly this result. So in fact, yeah, in a random matrix, these, these levels, although they're not equally spaced, for this quantity, it's as if they're almost equally spaced. Okay. All right, so those are the results I want of this rather simple problem. The, semi the fact that the density of states is finite at the, uh, uh, at the Fermi level, this leads to an entropy, this linear function of temperature which vanishes as temperature goes to zero. Um, and the entropy as a function of energy has this formula. Okay. So now I'm going to compute uh, something unfamiliar in the nest matter physics, uh, which is the many body density of states. Okay. So what is the many body density of states? Well, you have the many body energy, as we discussed last time, is the sum of uh, N alpha E alpha, where E alpha are the eigenstates of Tij, uh, and N alpha is zero or one. And so there's two to the N possible, possible values of uh, capital E. So just like we had n possible values of E alpha, and we computed the density of states, gave us a semicircle. Uh, now we want to translate that into what's called the many body density of states. Uh, D of E, which will be some average over uh, delta of E minus sum on alpha and alpha E alpha. Um, and you probably have to sum over all possible values of n alpha. So you, you uh, pick a matrix Tij, you get a set of E alpha, then you take all possible uh, two to the n states, put a delta function at all of their energies, and then average. This is the quantity we want to compute. Okay, this is actually quite hard to compute, and many things about it are not known in various regimes. Uh, but we can say something uh, quite simply in the regime where the energy is extensive. Um, here, I'm going to put E0 equal to just zero. It's kind of annoying to keep track of it. All energy is respect to the total energy is measured respect to zero. Okay, so what we expect is that this thing is simply by the definition of the entropy is exponential of S of E. Uh, when E is extensive, meaning it's proportional to N. Okay, um, so that's our result for this many body density states. It's exponential of square root of 2N gamma E. And it's really nothing but the sum of a law in a very different language. <laughs> okay. All right, so I'm going to use now, show a few slides, show you actual pictures of these things, uh, and then go on to the SYK model. So can I get the screen down, please? All right, so this is the, uh, I hope you can all see it. Yes, even the room and remotely. Um, so this is the semicircle density of states. This is the model we've just solved. So 
here's an actual picture of D of E. Okay, so we just take all possible many body density of states uh, and uh, compute D of E. This is for, I don't know, system of about, uh, I don't know, 20 sites or something, but you can easily do hundreds of sites, no problem. This is what you get. Uh, of course, this D of E is very large. You know, look at the number of states, 600 here. And what we're interested in the limit of low temperatures, which means down here, uh, you're near the ground state, but you want your energy still to be proportional to N. So E minus E naught should be proportional to N. So somewhere down here. Um, and there you should get D of E is E to the square root of two N gamma E. So this thing here as a function of E, uh, is e to the square root of e. That's how it's growing. Okay. All right. So what we're going to so that's the easy result. What we'd like to know more about uh, is what happens when you go to smaller energies. What happens as the energy becomes even smaller and you're much closer to the ground state and the energy is not extensive. Okay. I'll just show you pictures. We just zoom in, uh, and here are the individual energy levels. And um, so there's a long tail here with a very small density of states. Uh, and here are the individual levels. And what's happening down here? Well, with the energy is very small, close to the ground state. As I told you, what you do is you just remove and occupy states right near the Fermi level. You're just adding a particle here or removing a particle here. And these spacing is one over N. So if the spacing is one over N, uh, then the density of states roughly is the inverse of the spacing. So it's about an N. Whereas here, the density of states are about an E to the N. Okay, so that's a very rapid, much, you know, much, much larger here. This is a finite system. Of course, you can expand this by looking at much bigger systems. Okay. So now let's move on to something more interesting. <laughs> no, no, just, yeah, one, I'm going to show a few more slides. So this is the SYK model. Uh, it's very similar to the random matrix model I talked about, except there's no two fermion term. There's only interactions between the fermions. So you have sites alpha, beta, gamma, and delta that go from one to N. Um, and there's an interaction between any four sites where you take an electron from sites gamma and delta and move it as a matrix element or those two electrons moving together to sites alpha and beta. So that process has some amplitude, uh, U alpha, beta, gamma, delta. You know, so if you took some disordered metallic system, uh, you know, what you would normally do is you would first find the single particle eigenstates um, and then you'll have, say, some Coulomb interaction between the electrons. Then you'd figure out the matrix elements uh, of those uh, Coulomb interaction with all those single particle eigenstates. And you'll get some set of values, some numbers, so U alpha, beta, gamma, delta, generally very complicated. All right, so we, we'd like to solve this problem for arbitrary U alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Well, that's a nice dream, that's impossible, because unlike the random matrix problem, uh, the size of the matrix you have to diagonalize is not n by n, it's two to the n by two to the n, uh, because that's the total number of states roughly. Okay, you can improve that a bit, but uh, that's how it scales. It scales exponentially with n. Uh, and so that's essentially impossible for n bigger than 25, 30, even the best computers can't do it. All right, and you know, in a, in a disordered system, you would get fairly, random sorts of numbers for so U alpha, beta, gamma, delta with no obvious pattern to them. Okay, so the, the key assumption of the SYK model um, is that um, let's take these to be truly random numbers. And again, the main assumption is they're independent random numbers. Uh, no, in a real system, they probably aren't, but uh, let's work with that. So we work with independent random numbers uh, with zero mean and mean square value, which is u, u squared. Okay, so that's the full definition. And now the remarkable thing is um, this model can be solved. Uh, 
once you make the assumption of independent random numbers. Moreover, it's also very strongly self-averaging, even more strongly self-averaging than the uh, system we just talked about, because the number of states, even in a given system, is huge. Even a system of size, you know, 100, it's e to the 100, which is, you know, <laughs> bigger than the number of atoms in the solar system or something like that. Uh, okay. So, uh, and so, to, so even a single system has so many uh, possibilities for the states that if you measure some local correlation function, they'll be equal to the average. Uh, so you may as well average because uh, the actual results are self-averaging, even for a given set of numbers. So that's the remarkable feature here that uh, you can do the averaging uh, and that helps you solve something, but it actually gives you a lot of very detailed information and it's rare that you need more. Okay, sometimes you want to know the exact energy levels. It won't get you that, but it get you almost anything else. Anyway, so let me now just present some numerical results and uh, which will now derive uh, most of it. All right, so we just take a numerical diagonalization of this, this matrix now we can't do very big systems. I think this is about 17, 16 sites. So this is one system. And this is the many body density of states. We don't have any single particle density of states. Uh, this is what it looks like. Okay. Uh, you notice it's a much smoother curve. It doesn't have that tail down here. It's just, you know, it looks like uh, the same behavior all the way down to zero energy. All right, so what I'm going to show you now uh, is first of all, uh, what happens when the energy uh, is extensive when you're over here. So when the energy is extensive, you get almost exactly the same result we had for uh, the free particle system, square root of two n gamma e, with one crucial difference. There's a constant in front. Uh, there was no constant the other in the previous case. It was, just, it was just the second term over there in the exponential. And that constant then is the zero temperature entropy, uh, S zero. And for this particular model, it has a very specific value at half filling. It's a universal number uh, that we computed 20 years ago. Um, and, you know, it's, it's given by, I'll give you some route to how you compute it. Uh, today, even as a function of uh, charge density. Uh, and that's the zero temperature entropy. Uh, but it's very, it's absolutely not what people call the ground state entropy. The ground state entropy means you have a degeneracy of the ground state. Uh, and then you would say the log of the degeneracy of the ground state is the ground state entropy. Uh, some models have a finite ground state entropy, uh, even as a uh, uh, with uh, extensive ground state entropy proportional to n, uh, like some, you know, dimer packing problems or something. But that's, those problems are always finely tuned. Uh, that is, you have no interaction between dimers uh, and you have to close pack them. If you put even the slightest interaction between them beyond the hot core repulsion, the entropy goes away in the ground state. Uh, this is very different. It's not the ground state entropy, it's the zero temperature entropy. Uh, and I'll say in the board, what's the difference between them is when you get to that. Anyway, so this is what happens here. You know, seems like there is a zero temperature limit of the entropy, but it's not a violation of any law of thermodynamics because of this fact that it's a finite temperature entropy, not a uh, it's a zero temperature entropy. We take the limit temperature going to zero after you've taken the thermodynamic limit, not the other way around. Okay, so now we zoom in uh, to the very low energies. Uh, and what do you find? Well, even at low energies, the number of states is very dense. Okay, and so what do you find in fact, that this e to the n s naught, which was over here, the prefactor survives down to essentially the ground state. Uh, and the exponential here, the square root of two n gamma e, uh, actually now becomes in the prefactor. 
So there's a square root of E here. So this behavior right down here is a square root of E edge. And that square root of E edge is very similar to the square root of E edge of the semicircular. But now this is you know, way at the bottom here. Uh, but there's this huge prefactor. So what this is telling you, so this is really unimportant compared to this down here, that the spacing of these energy levels uh, is e to the minus n s naught. Okay, so even near the ground state, the energy levels are not degenerate, but they're exponentially close to each other uh, down here. I mean, this more dilute than up here, because here the spacing might be two to the minus e to the minus uh, uh, log two, and here it's e to the n log two, and here be minus n. This number. Uh, they're still very dense, but there's much less dense than here. Um, but they're not, they're much more dense than the N that we had for the single particle problem. So this, you know, so remember, I also told you last time that these very low energy states for the single particle problem were very similar to each other. You had some ground state, which is a, maybe a complicated uh, set of states that you occupied. But then you remove and add a few particles here and there, and you got all the states down here. So you were doing very simple thing, just changing them just a little bit. And when you just change them a little bit, you have to pay an energy cost, which was of order one over N. So the spacing here was one over N previously. Yeah, see there, this is one over N. You can even see by your eyes, it's much more uh, sparse, and now it's not one over n; it's e to the minus n s naught. So, what are these states down here, or anywhere? Well, the short answer is nobody knows. They are in this huge Fox space, and one state is totally different from the other. Uh, they just happen to have energies close to each other, uh, and we only know some statistical things about them. So, they are highly chaotic. And there's no description of when you go from one state to the other, they look totally different. And you couldn't say one is due to adding a few quasi particles uh, to the other one. In fact, there aren't enough quasi particles to do that. The number of quasi particles is about an n, the number of states you need is e to the n s naught. There's no way n quasi particles uh, at this very low energy is give you that many states. Okay. All right, so today we also know something more. We know how you go between that and that. So the, these two limits, there's one famous formula. Uh, it's sinc just square root of two n gamma e. Uh, and this comes from quantum gravity. This is a result of a uh, property of two-dimensional quantum gravity, JT gravity as it's called, um, and it's low energy limit. Um, I probably, <laughs> Not going to go into details of that. I'll try to give you some, some idea of the connection and how the cinch is obtained. Uh, but I want, my plan is to at least tell you how the S naught is obtained. Uh, that we had 20 years ago, uh, the cinch, well, I forget, uh, Altland et al. maybe, and Stanford and Witten obtained it about four or five years ago. Okay, and yeah, understanding that cinch and its extensions is a whole subfield of physics these days <laughs> with lots of uh, work going on on the theory of uh, how you cross over from here to there <laughs> in, in quantum gravity. All right, so I think I will, I have nothing else to say, do I? Yeah, you can also convert that density of states uh, actually, the, the, the result is obtained by the inverse uh, to an entropy because the uh, entropy is essentially the related to the density of state by Laplace transform when you go beyond the uh, saddle point approximation. Uh, and so the entropy here has a log t correction. Uh, and what's really computed is the log t, and then you invert that to get the d of e. Okay, that's really all I have to say. 
Uh, let me, how do I stop sharing? All right, so now we're going to go to the, not the free fermion random matrix model, uh, but the SYK model. Not a matrix, well, I mean, it's a huge matrix, but we don't want to deal with matrices that huge. Uh, it's really better thought of as a many body system with uh, these two body interactions. Okay, so the Hamiltonian was uh, now if I, uh, there was an N to the three halves and you'll see in a minute why there's an N to the three halves. Uh, so on alpha, beta, gamma, delta of U alpha, beta, gamma, delta, C dagger, alpha, C dagger beta, C gamma, C delta. Okay. Everything going from one to N. So that's the Hamiltonian. Uh, and so we're going to do exactly the same thing. We're going to compute G of I omega, and we're going to do it perturbatively in powers of U. Okay. <laughs> so this is going to equal First, the bare Green's function. Uh, and then there's going to be, uh, well, first order in U. Uh, you'll have a U here. This is the U, and this will be alpha, uh, beta, gamma, delta. Well, these have to do something, so they're going to have to close on themselves, something like that. Uh, and remember, we also have the rule that u alpha beta gamma delta average is equal to zero and they're independent matrix elements with average value u squared. Okay. All right, so this is zero, no problem. And you find that the remarkable simplification that happened for the uh, free fermion problem uh, also happens here. <laughs> in the end, in the free fermion problem, there's only one Feynman graph that contributed, which was just the, the hut. And you just had to put, make everything self-consistent. Exactly the same thing happens here. There's only one graph that contributes at order u squared, and everything else is a decoration of it. Okay, so let me at least write down the one graph that contributes, and then you have to check that all other graphs are down by some factors of one over n, as we explicitly checked at least to order uh, uh, t to the fourth uh, earlier. Okay, so the first graph that contributes is order u squared, fortunately, and it's essentially the end of the story. It's quite remarkable. So you have u here, uh, and then you have another u here. Uh, okay, now the alpha, beta, gamma, delta have to be the same. Um, yeah, so if this is alpha, beta, gamma, delta, so they have to meet and have the same index. So let's say this goes this way and we call that beta. Uh, this is delta, this is gamma, and that's alpha. Okay, so now I have only two u's, the average, this gives you u squared, uh, and there's a factor of one over n. So what do I get? You get one over n to the three, cubed from this, squaring this, uh, you get u squared, and you get sum over beta gamma delta of one, and the various g functions, which are all the same on each. Uh, and, and so this gives you n cubed. So the whole thing is just u squared. The n's disappear, and that's why I put the n to the three halves here. All right. Okay, so that's great. Uh, at least this graph survives. Uh, are there you know, any other graphs? I mean, okay, just for fun, let's see. I didn't prepare, but suppose, uh, what other graphs can you think of at order u squared? Well, you can think of graphs like this, for example, something like that. Uh, you know, oops, uh, have I got this right? No, that's not right. <laughs> uh, 
let me give it a different color. Uh, there's another interaction here and like that. Okay, this one, this one, this one, this one. Um, so if this has to somehow average out, well, if this is alpha and that's beta, then this will be beta again. Uh, this is gamma, that'll be gamma. Uh, well, uh, so there has to be some alpha here somewhere. Otherwise this alpha will be all lonely. So make that alpha uh, and then, but this has to be the same over here. So you know you're in trouble. So this alpha has to be the same alpha here. So there's no delta to sum over. So this is down by some factor of one over n. Okay, and you can go to next order at u cubed, okay, fine, nothing. u to the fourth, uh, what are the graphs that will appear? Uh, well, we can think of some that will appear and they are easy to understand. There'll be something like this, just this happening twice. So you'll get this, sorry, u, u, and then another u, something like this. So that's okay, that's allowed. Uh, no, 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 sorry, too many lines. <laughs> that would be nonsense. Yeah, here we go. Four lines coming out of each, u and one here. So that's allowed. Um, there's also something like this. Okay. <laughs> So in one of these lines, you put in another one of these things and so on. You could also put in another one here and so on. Uh, and you could do it many times and that's it, okay? So now we are experts at this and just by looking at these graphs, you can write everything in terms of a very simple equation. So the solution of this problem in the large n limit reduces to solving the following two equations. Well, let me leave that, yes. Yeah. So uh, are there higher moments of, of the disorder uh, zero? If not, uh, do they influence things somehow? Um, they don't in the end. Uh, you just need the second moment and the fact that they're all independent. Uh, it's not so easy to see that graphically, but uh, I'll introduce a, a functional formalism and uh, we can see it from that. Okay. Um, all right, so say so what the, the first equation is the exactly the same equation we had before for the Green's function in terms of the self energy. Um, and the second equation, now we do have to write it in time, otherwise it's more complicated. This is the self energy right here. Um, and it comes with a minus sign because of some fermion loops. So it's minus u squared, the ends cancel out. And what do you have? If this is times zero, this is times tau. Um, have I got this right? No, I have the arrows all wrong. So you go the other way. Two going that way, one coming back. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so there's g here, g here, and g of minus tau. So it's basically g squared of tau G of minus tau. That's it. <laughs> okay, there's only one graph and all these decorations are taken into account by Dyson's equation uh, and by putting full Green's functions rather than bare Green's functions uh, in the intermediate lines. All right, so there, there are these very simple equations. Uh, when I first wrote them down in 92, 93 sometime, uh, I said, well, surely somebody solved these equations. Somebody must have looked at this, uh, couldn't find it. Well, I'll say, okay, it'll take us a few months to figure it all out. Uh, well, we're still figuring out the full structure of these solutions. Actually, today have almost everything is known. Uh, these equations uh, contain in them some information on quantum gravity, believe it or not but this is all they are. <laughs> it's not the same thing as solving a quartic equation uh, because this is tau space and that's omega space. 
So the, you, uh, it's a very complicated integral differential equation. Okay. So this is the equation we have to solve to understand something about uh, uh, the structure of this problem. We were looking at a somewhat different problem, but anyway, the equations are the same. <laughs> All right, so really uh, much of the rest of this lecture for sure, will be just talking about the structure of solving these equations. You could view it as a problem of applied mathematics, but there's an amazing amount of physics. <laughs> that's physical insight that's needed before you fully understand what's going on with these equations. <laughs> Okay, so let's see, what are some of the things you can say uh, very quickly? Well, so you, you know, you make an, so as physicists, you say, well, let's just make an ansatz for a solution and see if it works. Now it's hopeless to solve it all frequencies. So let's make an ansatz for low frequencies. Okay, so, you know, you're going to plot, let's say I'm going to plot imaginary part uh, of G of omega on the real axis. So that has to be an even function of, I mean, it has to be positive for both negative and uh, positive frequencies. Uh, so one guess you might make, well, that there is a gap, okay? So there's some gap here where it's zero. So this it means there are no excitations, either particle-like or whole-like uh, uh, that near zero energy. So that's one guess you might make, okay? So imaginary part of G of omega has a gap, let's say. Can you find such a solution? Uh, and it's very easy to see that you don't because from the first equation, if you put I omega on the real axis, if, so in this region, G is real. Okay, if G is real, then from this equation, you also see uh, that sigma is real in that frequency range. Because this, you've gone to real frequency, this is also a real number. So sigma is real. So that means sigma also has a gap. So if I plot M sigma of omega, uh, that also has some sort of gap. And it's in fact exactly the same gap. It can't be anything di any different just from the first equation. All right, so now let's look at the second equation. Uh, so here you want to now relate the imaginary part of sigma to the imaginary part of G, okay? So this has, this requires you to go to frequency space, do some frequency integral uh, and get some relationship uh, between the left and the right-hand side. Um, let me just, so that's quite a mess. Uh, let me just say it in physical terms. So you here you have three particles, which have some energy. Uh, and at zero temperatures, uh, the energies have to add up, okay? The sum of the energies here must be equal to the energy over here. That's just conservation of energy. There's no particles around thermally excited particles. It's just injecting some energy uh, and that has to get split into three of these. And now the minimum energy that you can put into G is delta. So the right-hand side has a gap, since you're creating three of them, uh, has a gap of three delta. Okay. But the left-hand side uh, has already been known has a gap of delta. So this is a contradiction. You cannot get any gapped solution. If there's a solution at all of these equations, uh, which at all sensible, uh, it's can be delta has to be zero. All right, so there is no uh, gap full solution. So you rule that out. This is a very general sort of argument. This re all relies on the fact that there is the right hand side is non near in G. Uh, all right, so if there's no gap solution. These are, this is gone. Well, what, what could it be? Well, you know, the type of singularities you meet, there's some, there's some singularity um, as omega goes to zero. Okay, so let's say G of omega 
Uh, I'm going to be sloppy with all the factors here. Uh, it's all in the notes, factors of i and pi. <laughs> I can't possibly get those right. Uh, so let's say uh, it's omega to some power. Okay. Um, well, yeah, all right. So g of omega is omega to some power. Okay, so now we do a Fourier transform. This tells me g of tau in the long time limit, this is omega goes to zero. And it could have, you know, I'm gonna be sloppy also about positive or negative omega, we'll come back to that. Right now, imagine it's an e even function of omega, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, so when you take a Fourier transform, this is d omega, omega to the alpha, e to the i omega t, uh, and, and this will go then um, as uh, one over tau to the one plus alpha. So these powers here give you one plus alpha. Okay, let's not worry about the free factor. Okay, so g of tau goes as tau to the one plus alpha. So you plug this in here. So the right hand side gives you what sigma does, again being sloppy about tau and minus tau. Uh, so sigma of tau will go as one over tau to the three times one plus alpha. Okay, now you take another Fourier transform. Uh, it'll turn out that this thing, uh, you know, is a subleading singularity. So sigma of omega will be sigma of zero to another Fourier transform of this. It's d tau over this. So, uh, so you get, uh, uh, plus or minus some coefficient omega to the three times one plus alpha minus uh, minus one from the d tau. Okay. I don't know, it could be anything. <laughs> We're going to find out what alpha is. All right. So now we also want this number here to be positive as we'll see in a minute, because then it'll be a correction to this constant. We don't know this constant. Uh, and we want this number here to be negative. So that's, a, we'll see that's required. All right, so this just follows from using this equation. Okay, yes. Alpha will turn out to be negative as you see. Right now I haven't specified. Yeah, okay, right now all, right now alpha is totally arbitrary. If, and if this, this thing is negative, then this term is completely unimportant at zero frequency. Okay, let's suppose that this thing is negative. So this means sigma diverges as omega goes to zero. Okay, now if sigma diverges as omega goes to zero, you can forget about these terms. Now let's look at the second equation. If this diverges, this must vanish. Uh, and this, the negative of sigma must equal this. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, okay. So suppose that's the case. So now I have to be, take the negative of this and put it equal to that. Uh, so what do I get? So then this equation tells me uh, that alpha is equal to minus uh, three times one plus alpha minus one. And uh, okay, so now what is the solution of that? Uh, the solution of that is alpha is minus a half, if I've got this right. Uh, so that's three half, um, yeah, one half, three halves. Yeah, okay, there's only one solution, it's minus a half. But now we are in trouble. For this to work, we needed alpha to be positive and this to be uh, negative. And that's not the case. Both sides, both are actually positive, uh, negative. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> This is, this is not the right answer. So what's got to be the case? So what we have found is this thing uh, is positive. So, so in fact, this term is subdominant uh, compared to these terms and sigma of zero. So for this solution to work and to make sense, for this thing to dominate at low frequencies, what we must have is this mu must cancel this. I must also have mu equals sigma of zero. 
r minus yeah yeah plus okay if mu equals sigma of zero and this cancels out uh this is gone the omega this is omega if you plug in this this is omega to the one half omega to the one half is always bigger than omega as omega goes to zero so this term is less important this cancels out and now you're done so that's the answer uh, g of omega uh, goes as one over square root of omega and sigma of omega uh, is mu the chemical potential plus some constant times square root of omega that's the only that's the only reasonable solution i mean this doesn't prove it's a solution what you're saying is that if you have a solution to the power law singularity, this is the only way you'll get that. All right, so at this point, you just have to go to the computer and look for a solution uh, and just solve these equations numerically uh, and see if you find a solution with these properties. And indeed you do for a certain range of densities near half filling. If you move too far away, you find no solutions. But there's a comfortable range uh, where about density is about half the number of sites uh, where there is such a solution. And it's a compressible state uh, where you can vary the density at least near half filling uh, and the exponents remain exactly the same. You can also, there's also a whole bunch of stuff about the prefactors. Uh, which we're going to talk about uh, in a little bit. Okay, and also in time, uh, g is one over square root of tau. Okay. All right. So, so that's you know that's something you know uh, even I could have done and I did do <laughs> in an afternoon. Fine. This is the answer, uh, and it is the correct answer. Although it took you know a lot of numerical checking and lots of work. Uh, with Jinwoo to verify that this is the answer. Um, okay. All right, so this is extremely different from what we found for the random matrix problem. For the random matrix problem, so if I now plot G of omega, uh, you know, you can solve it numerically. Let's, let's, uh, So we, uh, what yeah. are the fundamental differences uh, between the random matrix model and the SYK that cause these correlations to appear? I mean, in a simple way, can we understand it? Well, I mean, it's an interacting system problem. Uh -huh. uh, and in the random matrix problem, this was not G squared G. In the uh -huh. random matrix problem, we had the same equations with the opposite sign, it was T squared times G. So here it was linear in G, here it's cubic in G. And that's in the terms of the equation, that's the only difference. That's, that's the entire difference. And those two equations have a very, very different structure. Uh, one, as you'll see, leads to a solution with a zero temperature entropy, the other one doesn't, uh, and so on. One has quasi particles, the other one doesn't. One is related to quantum gravity, and the other isn't. <laughs> I see. Yeah, uh, okay. Yeah, we'll get back to you. We're just yeah. trying to work out what the possible difference could, could be. And yeah, it's all, it's just G cubed versus G. It's amazing how that's the only difference. <laughs> in at least in the Schwinger Dyson equations. Uh -huh. Uh huh. Thank you. Yeah, here's the other equation. That's, that's it. <laughs> all of this is, of course, only for the free fermion system. It's a much harder job to compute these things. Uh, compute the value of gamma now. In fact, we'll, as I've already announced, there will be a gamma T correction to the entropy, uh, but computing gamma, uh, well, nobody can do it exactly. It requires some numerical work, uh, it is quite subtle. Um, anyway, so to summarize, if I plot the imagined, so G of omega is some, with some various phase factors, uh, one over square root of omega. And in fact, the, the coefficient here is a complex number in general. And so if we plot mg of omega, uh, 
you know, at large omega, it has to go as one, uh, well, it has to go to zero, probably exponentially fast, but it has a squared of omega divergence. Some peak like this. Uh, and for the random matrix problem, mg of omega, well, the minus there, uh, was the semicircle. So the semicircle has become this singularity at zero frequency. Okay. I mean, there you can get the full function. Here, all we have determined is the very low frequency behavior. Uh, I spent about six months of my life in 93 trying to get the next term a little bit away and I failed. Uh, today, a lot more is known about that. Uh, and maybe uh, I'll say something about that next time. Okay. All right, any questions? So there's a lot of things we now have to go from here, uh, figure out. Yeah, you had a question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, so we, uh, we, if we also had the quadratic term, uh, yeah. so does the self-energy get just this T squared in, uh, additive uh, term of T squared into G? So what happens, so if you add a small term like this, yes, and T is much smaller than U, yes, then what, what you'll find, uh, in the color, you'll find something that's one over square root of omega for a while, and then it it crosses over and becomes constant. And this scale where it crosses over is t squared over u. Okay, so it looks like a non-Fermi liquid down to a scale which is t squared over u, and then crosses over. So that's the energy scale at which quasi particles start appearing. Yes. So the, so once you add this term, the quasi particles do appear. Uh, at very low energies. I see. Yeah. So it goes back to the, uh, like a heavy Fermi liquid. Uh -huh. It's a normalized system. The density of states is a lot higher than it was before. So the specific heat is much higher. And so the effective mass, if you wish, gamma value is much higher. Uh, but it's, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, it happen, uh, but it happens at scale T squared over U, which is, actually smaller than you might naively expect. Naively, you would say, if I have a term of order T, then it should be a frequency of order T, I would yes, just break yes. down. But actually it doesn't break down till T squared over U. Uh -huh. So mm -hmm. the non-Fermi liquid is ultimately unstable, uh, uh, but it's a bit more stable than you might think naively. So uh, in terms of these uh, quasi-particles, it's like really a flattish band uh, of this bandwidth. Yeah, I don't know if I would say band, the word okay. band, yeah, you know, sure. this is all, yeah. there is no space here. Of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But if you took a lattice of these things, I, I agree mm -hmm. with you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so what should I do next? Uh, all right, so let me, now it turns out, well, I guess the, the next technical advance is speaking historically, uh, was made by uh, Georges and Parcolet uh, a little bit later. Um, there's also a Lattenge theorem, but we'll get to that eventually. Okay. Uh, right, okay, maybe I should say a little bit about this thing. Okay, uh, where is this? Well, okay, before I get to that, let me say a bit about uh, the asymmetry. So here I'm drawing these functions which are symmetric for positive and negative frequencies. Uh, but in fact, uh, they aren't in general. So let me introduce a quantity Q, which is just uh, one over N times the expectation value of the total number of particles. So if, I, if you've computed the full Green's function, you can just compute Q, okay? And Q is the total number, is the density, and so it's between uh, zero and one. So of course, the, if you had no particles, well, then it's good, you've solved the problem. If you had one particle per side, you've also solved the problem because there's only one state, every state is occupied. And the most interesting case is near two equals one half, uh, which is the particle hole symmetric point. 
So you can see that uh, if I plot the density of states, that this density of states m uh, g uh, g of omega uh, is equal to m g of minus omega for q equals one half. That's the half fill case. And so positive and negative frequency or particles and holes are coming with the same weight. Uh, so in fact, this, you know, uh, it's just uh, one over square root of omega for both positive and negative frequencies. Um, you can also say this in terms of uh, g of tau, and that's a bit easier to think in terms of g of tau in imaginary time. So I'm going to call this um, as some a plus uh, over square root of tau for tau greater than zero. This is at zero temperature. Uh, oh, is it negative? Sorry. So from the definition, yeah, it's negative. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, minus a plus square root of tau, uh, and this is a minus square root of mod tau for tau less than zero. So in imaginary time, the Green's function has to be real, uh, and it flips sign uh, for this for this density of states to be positive. If you just do the Laplace transform of the analytic continuation, you find that uh, these have to have opposite signs. Okay. All right. So Q equals one half. This is symmetric. A plus equals A minus. All right. So now if you go through this analysis that I just presented and are a little more careful with what's positive omega and what's negative omega and what's positive tau and negative tau, go through exactly what I went through there, just keeping track of A plus and A minus. Uh, and solving the whole thing. Uh, what you find then is that if you do this kind of low frequency analysis, uh, that you get a whole family of solution uh, does not determine uh, A plus over A minus. It's a free parameter and the solution exists. So you've got a whole family of solutions and this is good. You know, you'd be worried if you didn't get a family of solutions uh, because this, you got a solution for every mu. Didn't matter what mu was, it got canceled by sigma of zero. Uh, so you change the chemical potential. You can't possibly get the same solution because you're changing the density. If you got the same solution, the density wouldn't change. You want a solution for different densities so you need a one parameter solution. So therefore you now have one free parameter in the low energy behavior, which is A plus over A minus. And you have one free parameter in the high energy behavior. This is the high energy behavior because this is some, involves some over all frequencies with an equal time correlation function. You have to integrate over this whole thing to figure out the charge Q. So this is, if you wish the UV, uh, this is the IR. So the IR has one free parameter. The UV has one free parameter, which is Q. And I want to say this is analogous to what we even have for the Fermi liquid theory. In Fermi liquid theory, you have Q, the density, um, which is you know, a UV quantity because it involves all energies. And then you have uh, the Fermi wave vector, which is an IR quantity, uh, which is, uh, um, you know, related to where you have zero energy excitations. And then there's a relationship between IR and UV, between KF and Q, and that's the Ludinger relation. So you might suspect that there is a Ludinger relation between this IR quantity and this UV quantity. So this A plus over A minus is somewhat analogous to the Fermi wave vector for this non-Fermi liquid. And indeed there is. <laughs> There's an exact relation that you can work out. It's a bit complicated. I don't think I will work it out. Uh, and so you can determine A plus or A minus as a function of Q. So the Luttinger relation well, it was obtained by uh, George Pacoli and myself in 2001 uh, relation 
uh, determines exactly, and there's a, a somewhat complicated expression, determines A plus over A minus. And for obscure reasons, uh, I'm going to write that, that that ratio, I just give it another name. Uh, and that name is uh, what? Uh, e to the two pi E. Uh, script E. So this is just some number. E is a dimensionless number that goes from minus infinity to infinity. Uh, and so he determines this as a function of Q, which meant E as a function of Q. So there's a formula you can find in the notes for E as a function of Q. It's quite a messy formula. It takes a bit of work to get it, uh, but there's a known formula. And so now this is sort of highly, much more non-trivial check of the whole thing. Uh, you can go to your numerics and see if this formula works uh, and it works beautifully, <laughs> it's, it's obeyed. And that requires you know, the full solution of everything in a big computer. And then you compute the, the low frequency asymmetry between particles and holes and you get this formula. I mean, okay, so something you can see right away, you know, suppose Q is very small, Q is very small, then it's easier to add a particle and remove a particle because there's a lot of empty space. Adding a particle is this region. So if Q is very small, A plus would be much bigger than A minus. Conversely, when Q is close to one, you can more easily remove a particle than add a particle, which means that you're here and A minus will be much bigger than A plus. So as Q goes from zero to one, uh, E goes, so when Q is one, A minus is bigger, which means uh, E goes to uh, minus infinity. Yeah, so E goes from minus infinity to infinity as Q goes from zero to one. And there's a formula giving you that. Okay, I may have the signs right, but I think I got it right. Okay. And why have I called it E? Well, it turns out this E is related to the electric field on the surface of a charged black hole when you take the gravity interpretation. That's why I call it E. <laughs> okay. Um, but I won't get to that. All right. Questions? <laughs> okay, so this is, okay, this is just, uh, it would take, uh, I don't know, the proof of the learning relation, I'll probably say something, should I say it? Yeah, I'll probably say a little bit about it next time, uh, but not now here, I want to say something else, uh, which will also not be proven, but, uh, but it is, yeah, I'll, let me I'll talk about it in a minute. Okay. So one other thing you'd like to do, uh, and it will be very important for our considerations, since we want to determine the entropy, the many body density of states and all of that, uh, is to raise the temperature. So I'm just talking about zero temperature here, you go to finite temperature. So similarly, you can ask, what is the solution of these equations um, at a finite temperature? Uh, okay, so now today we know the answer to that. Uh, and that answer was first determined by Parkola and George. Um, well, I don't know exactly what the inspiration was, but there were some connections to the multi-channel condo problem that gave them a hint and then they could verify that it works. Um, and I will eventually next time give you a better understanding of where this comes from. Okay, so let's just consider the, uh, the case where, uh, Q equals one half to begin with. That's the simplest case where A plus equals A minus. Uh, and you may also have heard about the Majorana SYK model. Uh, that's basically the, with some factors of two here and there, uh, the Q equals one half case. And that's particle hole, has the particle hole symmetry built into it. Uh, so the, so what, what I'm talking about also applies uh, to the Majorana SYK model. So the G of tau, so then we know the G of tau uh, goes as minus some coefficient times sine of tau uh, over square root of tau. 
in this case. Okay, so this is at t equals zero. Um, and this, you know, we determined by, I haven't put anything under the rug, you can really figure this out. It's not, you know, it's easy to see that for half filling, a plus must equal a minus, this is just particle hole symmetry. Uh, then you just plug it in and solve and you can, you can even get the prefactor exactly. Uh, not too hard. <laughs> okay. Uh, but now the question is what happens as t goes to, to t greater than zero? Okay. So let me just say that uh, I'll give you the answer. Uh, and then you have to uh, check that it works. And that takes a bit of work, but the answer turns out to be G of tau. Uh, is, is again with some the same, let me put an equal to here. So there's some coefficient here, let's call that B. Uh, so minus B uh, and it will be pi T over sine pi T tau, the whole to one half. And this is for zero is greater than tau is greater than one over T. So the principal domain uh, at finite temperature. So this turns out to be the answer. Uh, and so what are the constraints here? Of course, uh, here I'm assuming that there's a temperature uh, and also the time or the inverse time uh, are much, much smaller uh, than U. So uh, the, I have very low temperature and very long time but the product of temperature and time could be anything. Okay. So uh, I've gone to low energies and I have a big circle in, in time space. That's the circumference of the circle is one over temperature. Uh, and uh, these are the conditions that I satisfy. So as long as you satisfy these conditions, the solution fits this. All right, so where did this come from? Well, like I mentioned, uh, it came by analogy to the multi-channel condo problem where there's a conformal symmetry. And this is a very typical kind of correlator that you get in conformal field theory. Uh, anyway, so, you know, this Hamiltonian is not conformal, but it seems like there is some emergent conformal symmetry. Uh, and we'll discuss that uh, next time for sure. But uh, you could, even if you didn't know much, here's the reasoning you can follow and check. And this is actually a fun exercise to check. And it's actually done in the notes. You make this answer saying, well, maybe there's some conformal invariance and this is the conformal answer. So you make the answers, take this G of tau, you plug it in here, you got sigma of tau. Take the Fourier transform sigma of tau, you get some horrible complication functions of ratio of gamma functions. Similarly, you take G of tau and you take its Fourier transform, you get some horrible ratio of gamma functions. And those two functions have to be inverses of each other uh, for all omega and temperature, not just the power law, but everything. And you find they agree perfectly. So that pedestrian calculation is, is in the notes. Just a matter of doing, opening up your Grastein and Rizik and doing some integrals of, and Fourier transform of this function. <laughs> or Mathematica, I guess Mathematica can handle it. <laughs> uh, all right, so that's the solution. In fact, there's no question mark. This is the solution uh, at finite temperature and it has a structure very similar to conformal field theory. And what's very striking here, and this was actually, uh, I mean, I suspected there was what, what I, you know, our very first paper we knew there'd be something like this, that it'll be, it'll be some function of T tau. Uh, we didn't guess it was just a very simple function. Uh, but whatever the function is, there's something very interesting here, which is that the natural time scale uh, that's appearing down here is just temperature. So when you could look at real time correlation function, you'll see that the spectral function become very broad. Uh, so this, this is telling you that the damping frequency in real, frequency, real time You know, some kind of some kind of damped harmonic oscillator, if you wish, but not quite. Uh, the damping frequency is just kBT over h bar. 
And that's really one of the most important properties of this model that if you perturb it and you look at any time dependence, things will relax back uh, to thermal equilibrium in a time which is the inverse of H bar over KBT. Uh, and that's actually one very important difference between here and a conformal field theory. If you take a simple conformal field theory, you still have these correlation functions, but when you actually look at, uh, uh, well, well you, you, because it's the conformal field theory is essentially a free field theory, almost all of the simple ones are the integrable in some sense. Although they do have this time scale, they don't relax back to thermal equilibrium. They don't thermalize in this time. They, they take much longer. But here you have, the, you know, you have the best of both worlds. You both have the conformal symmetry and you have thermalization in the same time of H bar over KT. And, and this kind of frequency is also you know, very typical, in fact, it's typical of black holes where they have a, what's called a quasi-normal mode damping frequency, which is again, the Hawking temperature divided by Planck's constant. So at least uh, in my own experience, that was the first hint that there's a connection between such problems uh, with these thermal damping Planckian frequencies as we call them and black holes. Uh, it's a very, yeah, okay. <laughs> I think I should stop right there. Okay. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, Subro. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, a while back about uh, this uh, zero temperature solution, uh, yeah. you uh, solved for the omega going to zero limit. Yeah. So, and got this expression of one over uh, square root omega. So, <laughs> What is the energy scale? Is there an energy scale at which this solution sort of stops working? You and basically you. that's set by you. Yeah, yeah. There's only there's only one dimensional parameter in the whole solution is you. So there's no cutoff. This is a UV finite problem. Right. So you know there's no upper frequency cutoff. Yes. And the only frequency scale here is U and temperature. There's nothing else, and it's a UV finite problem. So that's why there's no emergent scales of any type. <laughs> okay. Yes. All right, great. So have a good weekend and we'll continue on Monday. Yeah, go ahead, please. Use the uh, mic. So in above case, uh, where we, we uh, approximate G of I omega is Omega yeah. to the power alpha in small omega limit. Yeah. So we are solving that thing for a particular mu, where mu is equal to sigma of zero. Well, I, I at this point I was very sloppy about positive and negative frequencies. So, uh, but so this kind of reasoning, not worrying in detail of what's positive, what's negative, works for any mu, and no matter what mu. So there's a constraint. I mean, there's no guarantee that this would work. So what you find is that if there's a solution. The answer could be there's no solution. Then you just go home, uh, which is what I first thought. <laughs> okay, but if there's a solution, and it's first of all, it has to be gapless. Secondly, it has to have this power one half, and second and thirdly, mu sigma of zero equals mu. These are all the constraints we found in solution. Will all three constraints be satisfied by an actual solution? I don't know. You have to do the numerics and see if it works. And in fact, it does. Okay, <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, in some sense, these are infinite numbers of equations for an infinite number of variables. And you, if you discretize time or something, you know, and, and strange things can happen. You don't know whether there's a solution or not, but, but, but there's some constraints we found on a solution and these are satisfied. Those constraints come from that thing, right? You, you take that G to be omega to the power alpha. Well, okay, let me say it again. So you take, first you start with saying omega, alpha, alpha could be anything. And you do all these Fourier transforms and you get this result. Now you have to put this result in here. And now you have to ask, now that in the denominator, there's many terms. There's the I omega, there's the mu, there's the sigma of zero and this. So you have, to just, you have to pick the largest term. Which term is the largest? My first guess was this term is the largest. 
Now, this term would be largest if this whole thing is negative. And then I ran into a contradiction. I found, couldn't find a solution because when you find the solution, you find this, this is positive. So end of story. So this term is not the largest. So, but how can this term ever be the answer? Well, the only way this term could ever be the answer, if it's, this is positive, is if the sigma of zero exactly cancels the mu, then it would, it would at least the first two, the zero order terms would disappear, but you still have the i omega term there. But then you have the constraint that this term better be smaller than one, because if it's not smaller than one, then the i omega would be the most important term. So it better be smaller than one, and it, indeed it is, it's one half. So there's only one possible solution. If there's a solution, it must obey alpha equals minus half and mu equals sigma zero. Uh, yeah, that's the only possible solution. Just from very simple power counting and algebra. Okay, there's no guarantee there's such a solution, but that's the only one possible. To see that there is such a solution, you have to put it on the computer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you have to make sure your program works well. And so there were a lot of very nervous ones, but I didn't, you know, weren't sure. But it, it, there is a solution. Yeah, it works, luckily. <laughs>